as a last example, let's look at A4. This is partly an excuse to introduce ourselves to the alternating group, which may have been introduced in a previous class, but let's review it anyways. So remember, the symmetric group is the set of all bijections from an n set to an n set. And here, square brackets n is a shorthand notation for the positive integers 1 through n. And so there's multiple ways to define the alternating group. The easiest one is to recognize that you can always represent permutations as permutation matrices, which is kind of a weird way to do it, but let's go with that approach. So you know the permutation 1, 3, 2 as a cycle corresponds to the matrix where, let's see here. So the point is you have a basis E1, E2, and E3, and your linear transformation sends E1 to E3, sends E2 to E1, and it sends E3 to E2. So you create a basis where the, basically the um, linear transformation just permutes the basis vectors. So permutation matrix is a matrix that has exactly one one in every row and column and zeros everywhere else. And I'm taking the long way to describe how you construct the matrix. After I construct it, we'll do the shortcut. But the reason why I'm doing the long way is this explains why every permutation gives rise to a permutation matrix is because this is the basis, this is the linear transformation, now let's write down the matrix. Well, we know if you multiply by E1, you need to get E3, so the first column should be 0, 0, 1. If you multiply by E2, you should get E1, so the second column should be 1, 0, 0, and finally, the third column should be 0, 1, 0. And so here's the permutation matrix. And the reason why I'm defining it this way is because matrices have a well-defined determinant. And more importantly, in the case of a permutation matrix, you can prove that the determinant must be plus or minus 1. And so then you can define the kernel to be, I mean the alternating group to be the kernel of the determinant map. So sigma is in the alternating group if and only if the kernel of the determinant of the permutation matrix is 1. That's one way to define it. And of course, if you, depending on the modern algebra background you've had, this is not the only way to define it, but it's the quickest. The other way to define it is to define it in terms of even and odd permutations. And that has to do with the theorem that if you write sigma as a product of like so, where each of the factors on the second side is a two cycle, which is also known as a transposition then the theorem is that k is congruent to m mod 2. So that's one of the theorems you prove in the, sometimes in modern algebra or in algebra 1 that if you write a permutation as a product of two cycles or transpositions, then any two decompositions as a product of transpositions must have the same length mod 2. So either you can write it as a product of an even number of transpositions or a product of an odd number of transpositions, but you can't do both. And then the alternating group corresponds to the even ones, the product, any permutation that can be written as a product of an even number of transpositions. 
So the proof in the algebra courses of this fact is actually quite a pain, but if you do this permutation matrix approach, it's actually much quicker because the determinant of a transposition can be easily proven by induction to be negative one. And so determinant is well-defined function, you know, determinant of the product is the product of the determinants. These are each gonna have the same power up. Uh, you can prove that the determinant here is gonna be negative one to the k and negative one to the m. And so k is, has to be congruent to m mod two. So we'll study that group more often as time goes on because it's actually an important group in the history of group theory. But let's look at A4 first. A4 is kind of special among alternating groups because it actually has a non-trivial normal subgroup. But let's see, so the identity permutation is always in there. And so products of two transpositions are going to be even, right? So one, two, three, four, one, three, two, four, one, four, two, three. These three, four are going to be in the alternating group. You can actually check that it turns out that these four elements together actually form a subgroup. And it turns out they form a normal subgroup in A4. It's a Klein four group. It also turns out that any three cycle is in the alternating group because you can write a three cycle as a product of two two cycles. Let's see if I can do it. Let's think carefully. So one should go to two and then that takes care of that one. Two goes to one, one goes to three and then that forces two to go to three and then you can see that three goes to one. So there's a way to decompose it. So there's nothing special about 1, 2, and 3 here. If I replace it with A, B, and C, you can see how you could write a, pro a 3 cycle as a product of two 2 cycles. In general, any, five, any odd cycle can be written as a product of an even number of 2 cycles, and any even cycle has to be written as an odd number of 2 cycles. And so we also have 1, 2, 4. 1, 3, 4, 2, 3, 4, and obviously they're inverses. So now I can erase this bit. 1, 3, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1, 4, 3, and 2, 4, 3. I guess here is also worth noting how we do products of cycles in this course, because sometimes there's distinctions. We multiply from right to left, because that's how function composition works. So if I want to figure out what this product does as a permutation to the number one, I read from right to left, I look at the first permutation, I see one goes to three. So sigma, or if I call this sigma, and tau, I see sigma tau of one is sigma of three. And then in the second permutation, three goes to one. So sigma of three is one. So sigma composed with tau is one. And you can check that um, two goes to one, and then one goes to two, so two goes to two, three goes to two, and two goes to three, so three goes to two, so two goes back to three, and so we actually see that these are inverses. So we compose from right to left, but within the cycles we read from left to right, which I admit is always an annoying convention. Last time I taught the course I realized that it would have been great Historically, if we actually wrote the entries within a cycle from right to left as well, that'd make it less confusing, but oh well. The whole point here was to look at conjugacy classes. So let's look at the centralizer in this 
a four of one, two, three. So we're looking at elements that when you conjugate with one, two, three, you get one, two, three back. Well, let's see what G123, G inverse does with an element I. Well, you're going to get G inverse of I first. Let's call it G inverse of IJ, because I don't know what it is. So we're going to G applied to 1, 2, 3 applied to J. So whatever this is, it's going to be sigma of j. You know what, this is actually going to be easier to do if I just do an explicit example to get our minds around what this looks like. Let's do one of these conjugations just to get our minds around us. And there's a reason why I'm doing this, because there's another result we're going to do soon. But seeing a special case of it actually gives an idea or allows us to conjecture the more general result. So let's conjugate 1, 2, 3 by the permutation 1, 2, 3, 4, which is its own inverse. This is also good practice because it shows us how to do these permutation calculations. So what happens to 1? 1 goes to 1, 1 goes to 2. So now we're looking at 2. 2 goes to 3. Now we're looking at 3. 3 goes to 4. 4 goes to 4. So we see that 1 goes to 4. All right, now our new favorite number is 4. We want to figure out the cycle decomposition of our product. And we're starting with 1 because that's always customarily what we do. So let's start at 4 now because we want to compute what this new permutation does to 4. 4 goes to 3, 3 goes to 3, 3 goes to 1, and 1 goes to 2. So 1, 4, 2 so far. Now let's look at what happens to 2. 2 goes to 2, 2 goes to 1, 1 goes back to 2, and 2 goes back to 1. So the cycle closes off. And by process of elimination, there's only one element left. It must be in a one cycle by itself. But let's calculate it anyways. 3 goes to 4. 4 goes to 4. 4 goes to 4. 4 goes back to 3. So we see 3 goes to 3. So we see our conjugation gave us 1, 4, 2, which was not in the centralizer. So. Shoot, that didn't work. So going through and doing all these conjugates to figure out what's in the centralizer would take a lot of work. It'd probably be smarter to figure out what happens when you conjugate. So I conjugated by this permutation, and my three cycle stayed a three cycle. And And if I look at different ways of writing this in the three different cyclic shifts, I get these three different ways I could have written the same cycle. And I notice that what does this permutation do originally that I'm conjugating by? It swaps 1 with 2 and 3 with 4. And look, in this last version, 3 got replaced with 4, and 1 and 2 switched locations. And so one of the theorems we'll prove later is that for conjugating in the symmetric group, this is exactly what happens. If you conjugate by a permutation by another one, if you conjugate a cycle, by any permutation, which you're going to get is a new cycle that looks like this one. 
Now we're going to assume this for now as a conjecture because we're going to prove it in another video because it's the next part of this section of the textbook. But for now we're going to use it so that we can actually do these calculations because it allows us to know what happens when you conjugate. Granted, it's conjugating by elements in the larger symmetric group, but it gives us an idea for what this group is going to look like. Anyhow, what do we know about this group? Well, we know it's going to contain the cyc cyclic group that on 1, 2, 3, and it's got to be a subgroup of all of A4. As we just saw, it can't be all of A4. And so this is a group of size 12. This is a group of size 3. So your only options are that it's going to have to be a subgroup of, it's got to be the cycle, or it's got to be a subgroup of size 6. And you can actually prove that there's no subgroup of size 6 in this group of size, in the alternating group on four symbols. That's a common counterexample for Lagrange's theorem that people do. And the way you prove that is you show that any subgroup of psi 6 would end up, would have to have one three cycle, and then you do a clever argument to end up showing that it ends up having all the three cycles. And whoops, there's eight, which is larger than six. I'm not going to repeat that argument though. You can try to construct it on your own. It's kind of interesting but I think this example's already gone on way too far. So the point is, we see that the centralizer of the cycle is this group, which has size three, which means that the index of the centralizer is four which means that there are exactly four cycles that are conjugate to one, two, three. And using our conjecture, we know that they are in fact all three cycles. And we actually had one of them. It was the, the one where we had two, one, and four. So one, four, two. Is one of the conjugacy conjugates. There has to be uh, at least two others in there, so you should try to figure out what they are. It's probably not too hard of a guess to try conjugating by these two other permutations. So one, three, two, four. I replace the one with the three, and I and the three with the one, and I swap two and four. Again, up to cyclic shift, that's 1, 3, 4. And finally, I can get another conjugate by conjugating by this final permutation, 1, 4, 2, 3. So 1 becomes 4, and 2 and 3 switch roles. Um, 2, 4, 3. So there's one conjugacy class. But, of course, there has to be more conjugacy classes than that. Namely, by the exact same logic, this same calculation works for any three cycle. We only got half the three cycles, so the other four three cycles have to form the other conjugacy class. So we got... And, in fact, they are the inverses of the three cycles in the first conjug conjugacy class, as bizarre as that is. So here are two of our conjugacy classes. So we still have some more work to do. So there's two conjugacy classes down. We still have four elements left. Obviously the identity is in the centralizer, so the only question remaining is what happens with these three bozos? So what is the centralizer in A4 of the product of disjoint transpositions? If it ends up being everything, that kind of tells you that this was in the center. So 
So we got one subgroup inclusion, and then we have the whole group. That's a subgroup of size 2, that's a subgroup of size 12. We already know there's no subgroup of size 6, so our only possibilities are either 2, 4, or 12. So in this last case, it's actually in the center, in which case these would be 2, and in this case, it's a subgroup of size 4, in which case there would be three elements in the center, and there's three elements. I mean, the conjugacy class of this cycle has size 3, which means it would be these three guys all together. And in this other case, well, this other case we see is impossible, because that would tell us that this the conjugacy class of this element has size 6, and there isn't six elements left. So process of elimination, it can't be that. So we just have to rule out one of these two cases. Is it the case that every element commutes with this product? Well, I mean, if you just conjugate by 1, 2, 3, what's going to happen? Well, 1 and 1 becomes 3, 2 becomes, oh no, hold on, let me be careful. So 1 becomes 2, 2 becomes 3, 3 becomes 1, and 4 is left alone. Oops, that's not the same permutation. So the centralizer isn't everything. So congratulations, the centralizer has size 4. That means that the index of this centralizer in A4 is going to be size 3, which means we've actually got the three two cycles all together in one conjugacy class. And so in this case, 12 is equal to 1 plus 3 plus 4 plus 4. So this was a very long example, but the advantage of doing it was that we actually managed to get a non-trivial sum that wasn't just all the same conjugacy classes being the same size. So it's kind of nice for that fact. And it's kind of nice because in this example, we actually had to use some logic to rule out some options. The disadvantage is we were relying on an unproven conjecture, but we're going to fill in that gap in a little bit. I think the interesting thing here is that these two conjugacy classes are separate, and that same feature will happen with A5. So eventually we'll do A5 as well. That calculation is a lot more complicated because the group is a lot bigger, but it's an important calculation to do because it's one of the simplest proofs that A5 has no normal subgroup.